of the Congressional Executive Commission on China on the future of women in China, Me Too, censorship, and gender inequality will come to order. One week from today, the world will mark International Women's Day. This is an occasion not only to celebrate the critical role women and girls play in families, communities, and societies across the globe, but to also reflect on how those societies can better protect the fundamental human rights of women and girls. Governments that fail to treat women equally prevent their countries from reaching their full potential. Those that empower women in political, social, and economic life are more prosperous and peaceful. Over 70 years ago, Mao Zedong acknowledged the importance of women in Chinese society with his famous statement that women hold up half the sky. Yet, as this commission fulfills its mandate to monitor human rights in China, we continue to find a mixed picture when it comes to the status of women. While the Chinese government implements laws and regulations intended to address persistent issues related to gender-based violence, discrimination, and harassment, women face significant challenges in all of these areas. In recent months, several high-profile cases shined a bright spotlight on the vulnerability of women to violence. In November, tennis star Peng Shui accused a senior Chinese Communist Party official of sexual assault. In January, a video appeared showing a rural woman, reportedly the mother of eight, chained by her neck in an outdoor shed, sparking serious concerns about human trafficking, the impact of policies of population control, and the treatment of persons with mental disorders. These stories come on the heels of other cases of domestic violence and workplace harassment that reinvigorated the Me Too movement, as well as horrifying reports of rape committed against Uyghur women in intrusive homestay programs and mass internment camps. A brave survivor of these camps will tell her story to us today. While many of these reports generated intense interest within China, the Chinese Communist Party worked to suppress them and stifle expression related to women's rights, just as it constricts freedom of expression in civil society more broadly. It's been seven years since China jailed five female activists for publicizing sexual harassment on public transportation, and feminists, that is, advocates for improving the condition of women in China, continue to be denied the space to speak up, to organize, as demonstrated by the coordination of online attacks and the shutdown of feminist social media accounts last spring. In political life, women are excluded from positions of power, with not a single woman serving on the Politburo Standing Committee, and only one woman serving on the 25-member Politburo, and few women serving at senior levels of county, municipal, and provincial governments. Many of the most egregious abuses deny the fundamental freedom for families to decide if, when, and how to have children. Forced sterilizations and forced abortions, such as those prompted for years by the one-child policy and those reported in recent years by the Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims, are atrocities. The move to a three-child policy raises the specter of a new coercive tools and tactics denying freedom. This all adds up to a complex landscape for women's rights in China, deserving close scrutiny through today's hearing. This is the first time the Congressional Executive Commission on China has held a hearing dedicated to this set of issues, and it shouldn't be the last. I look forward to our witnesses helping us understand ways we can better stand up for women in China. Now recognize Congre Congressman McGovern for his opening remarks. Well, thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing on the future of women in China, Me Too, censorship, and gender inequality. I am proud that this is the Commission's first ever hearing, specifically on the status of women. Uh, it is timely, given the spotlight on the uh, Peng, uh, Peng Shu I, I case of sexual assault and cover-up and changes in the party's policy on gender. Since 2005, the Commission has included a standalone section on, on uh, status of women in its annual report. 
That initial entry found that while the Chinese constitution and laws provide for equal rights for women, in reality, they have fewer employment opportunities than men, and their educational levels fall below those of men. Today, we find this uh, dynamic much the same. The Chinese government continues to implement laws and regulations aimed at equality. For example, in January of 2021, a specific definition of sexual harassment was codified in the Civil Code, creating liability for employers and detailing the kinds of conduct that would fall under the definition of sexual harassment. But in their everyday experience, women continue to face discrimination in employment, education, wages, and legal redress. Last September, authorities detained uh, uh, uh, Sophie Wang Shui Chen and Wang Jianbing, advocates of the China's Me Too movement, under the charge of incitement of subversion of state power. Why in the world would advocating for women's rights be considered a crime against the state? Repression of women has also been documented in the Commission's population control section on the Chinese government's heavy-handed policies to limit births, including the human rights abuses of forced abortion and forced sterilization. We have monitored these horrific practices as part of the government's campaign against Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslim women, and we will hear testimony from a survivor today. For others in the People's Republic of China, however, uh, these population policies are evolving as authorities respond to the social and economic consequences of demogra demographic changes. We would like to know where these policies are headed and whether Chinese authorities' heavy-handed approach will man manifest itself in a different way. I welcome the witnesses, and I look forward to your testimonies. Uh, and again, I want to thank uh, Chairman Merkley for uh, coordinating this hearing. I think it is uh, long overdue. With that, I uh, yield back my time. Congressman Smith uh, now wishes to deliver some opening comments. Congressman. Chairman, and thank you for convening today's important hearing. I'd like to concentrate my remarks on the most coercive, horrific, and systematic abuse of women's rights uh, by the Chinese Communist Party. For decades, the women of China were subjected to the brutal one-child per couple policy under which countless numbers of women were forcibly aborted and sterilized against their will. I chaired dozens of hearings, including as chairman of this commission uh, and my subcommittee on human rights and the foreign affairs committee on this egregious abuse and heard directly from many women who were forcibly aborted. I would note parenthetically, I led the successful effort to reverse a Clinton administration policy that denied asylum to those who are fleeing uh, forced abortion and also offered an amendment back in 1985 that is still the law, uh, that we will not contribute to any organization uh, that supports or co-manages a coercive population control program. That was back in 85. The trauma of being abducted and forcibly brought to an abortionist by police and family planning cadres has few parallels in the world. At one of my congressional hearings I chaired in 2009, for example, a Chinese college student named Wu Jian said that she was brought to a hospital against her will and she testified that, and I quote her in part, as soon as I was taken out of the van, I saw hundreds of pregnant moms there, all of them just like pigs in the slaughterhouse. The room was full of moms who had just gone through a forced abortion. Some moms were crying, some moms were screaming, and one mom was rolling on the floor in unbearable pain. Then it was my turn. It was the end of the world for me, she said. When the surgery was finished, the nurse showed me part of my baby's bloody foot with her tweezers, close quote. As I think members of our, who will be testifying today, members of our commission know, the girl child in particular was targeted in the womb, given the cultural preference for, for boys. If only one child or two or even three was allowed, it was the girl who was exterminated, something we all called and call gender side. This has led to the world's most significant gender imbalance uh, anywhere in history. According to the Congressional Research Service, as of 2021, there was a reported 689 females and 723 males in China, leading to, quote, quote, the world's most skewed sex ratio at birth, with 111 males for every 100 females per the 2020 data. This has only been partially ameliorated by the CCP's 
belated recognition that they have created a democratic demographic time bomb and the change to a two child per policy in 2015 and now a three child per policy as of last year. The coercive hand of the state is nonetheless still present. Indeed, this commission conducted a series of hearings following the adoption of the two child per couple policy. The conclusions drawn from those hearings was that the two child policy should not be lauded because it did not change the basic structure of coercion, coercive population control in China. And it appears the same is true for the three child per couple policy. The policy still violates international human rights norms. Women in China still endure coercive pregnancy monitoring, fines, and the immense psychological burden of enforced birth limits. At least as of 2017, China was the only country in the world where the female suicide rate is higher than the male. Experts differ on the exact number, but estimates indicated that between 25 and 40 percent more women kill themselves each year through suicide than men. That doesn't happen anywhere in the world. A contributing factor has been the coercive power uh, to destroy their children while in utero. Let us not forget the bureaucracy that has been created, mobilized, and invested in population control. The new policy does not dismantle the brutal machinery of enforcement, nor does it remove the pernicious incentives given to local officials to pressure mothers to abort a child if the birth hasn't been approved by the state. And even if the situation has ameliorated somewhat for women from the ethnic Han Chinese majority, the CCP's ruthless antinatalism is still played out with a vengeance, as we all know, Mr. Chairman, in genocidal policies aimed at reducing Central Asian populations, uh, including the Uyghur uh, uh, uh, minority uh, and others, the Kazakhs and the Kyrgyz. Last year, an independent tribunal in the United Kingdom, chaired by Jeffrey Nice, who led the prosecution of former Serbian, Serbian President Slobodan Milosevic to determine whether the CCP's policies amounted to genocide, one of the witnesses named Razi presented testimony regarding how she was forcibly aborted and told a similar story that I have heard for the last, since 1983, when I first started my effort to combat this heinous abuse of women's rights. A female OBGYN uh, GYN, uh, named Dr. Gafour told how if a household had more births than allowed, they would raise the home, they would flatten the house and destroy it. I also had at one of my hearings a woman uh, who we were able to get out of the country who ran a family planning program in Fujian province. Her self-description was, by day I was a monster, by night a wife and mother of only one, and that she would have women in their eighth and ninth pregnancy pleading with her to allow them to carry their baby to term. But she said with resoluteness, we would abort each and every one of them. Let me just conclude by pointing out that one of our hearings, and you know this, Mr. Chairman, it was our commission. We did hear from Mirago Tursen, uh, who recounted her ordeal of torture, abuse, and detention in the Chinese camps. We've heard from many others over time. Uh, we know, as we all know, Xi Jinping is continuing his, his genocide. And let me just say, uh, I asked repeatedly during the Obama administration and even the Bush administration, as the author of the Trafficking Victims Protection Act and four other laws to combat human trafficking, uh, that what is the linkage between forced abortion, the gender side of Chinese, of the girl child, and trafficking? And finally, the HIP report, Trafficking Versus Report, recognized that not only is there a linkage, it is one of the reasons why so many women are being trafficked into China because of the dearth, the lack of uh, women and the girl child who have been exterminated as a result of this horrible policy. So thank you again for calling this hearing. Uh, I think we have to be very clear uh, that, that this is not over, um, despite what Xi Jinping and others might have said. The machinery of the forced abortion policy remains intact, and that is cause for great, great concern. Yield back, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Congressman. I'd now like to introduce our panel of witnesses, starting with Dr. Leita Hong Fincher. She is a journalist and author of Betraying Big Brother, The Feminist Awakening in China, as well as Leftover Women, The Resurgence of Gender Inequality in China. She is an adjunct professor at Columbia University's Department of East Asian Language and Cultures. 
She won the Society of Professional Journalists Sigma Delta Chai Award for her China reporting. Aaron Halegua is a lawyer and research fellow at New York University Law School Center for Labor and Employment Law and the U.S. Asia Law Institute. In 2021, he authored the report, Workplace Gender-Based Harassment and Violence in China, Harmonizing Domestic Law and Practice with International Standards. He has worked on labor rights issues for nearly 20 years, including consulting on labor issues in China, Thailand, Burma, Malaysia, and Mexico. Mei Fong is Chief Communications Officer at Human Rights Watch and a former Pulitzer Prize winning Wall Street Journal China correspondent. Her book, One Child, The Story of China's Most Radical Experiment, won a nonfiction award from the American Society of Journalists and Authors. Foreign Policy Magazine named her to its top 50 list of US-China influencers. She was previously Director of Communications and Strategy at the Center for Public Integrity. And Tersenai Zaiwuden is a survivor of the Chinese government's mass internment camps in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. As one of the very few survivors of these camps who has reached safety in another country, she has provided testimony to human rights groups, to researchers and journalists investigating the genocide against Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims. Her brave voice exposed to the world the sheer depravity of the mass internment camps and their horrific treatment of women. We will now hear directly from our witnesses, starting with Dr. Hong Fincher. Uh, Chairman Merkley, Chairman McGovern, and distinguished members of the commission, Thank you for holding this important and timely hearing and inviting me to testify. While the entire world watches Russia's horrifying invasion of Ukraine, the Chinese government refuses to call Russia's actions an invasion. President Xi Jinping appears to be aligning himself with Vladimir Putin, further undermining the rules-based international order. There are many reasons that China's communist regime has survived for over 70 years in spite of the collapse of communism in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. But it is impossible to understand the longevity of China's Communist Party without recognizing the patriarchal underpinnings of its authoritarianism. In short, Xi Jinping views patriarchal authoritarianism and the subjugation of women as critical for the survival of the Communist Party. China's economy has entered a protracted slowdown, just as the country is beginning to face the demographic crisis of an aging population, falling birth rates, and a shrinking workforce. In response, the government has revived sexist elements of Confucianism, upholding the male-dominated family as the basic foundation of a strong nation. State propaganda praises Xi Jinping's traditional, quote, family values, and presents him as the father of the Chinese nation in a, quote, family state under heaven, in which obedient wives and mothers in the home are key to solving China's most pressing social problems. China's propaganda apparatus began a crass campaign in 2007 to stigmatize single, educated Han Chinese women in their late 20s, mocking them as, quote, leftover women to push them into marrying and having babies for the good of the nation. This pro-marriage, pro-natalist propaganda has only become more intense with the adoption of a two-child policy in 2016 and the three-child policy last summer. China's population planning policies also have a strong undertone of eugenics. Even as officials urge Han Chinese women to marry and get pregnant, in order to, quote, upgrade population quality, they are slashing birth rates among ethnic minority women, in particular Uyghur women and other Turkic women in Xinjiang with forced sterilizations and abortions, as witness Dursanai Ziawudun will describe in her testimony. The government is carrying out a sweeping crackdown on feminist activists who pose a unique challenge to China's all-male rulers. As a result, the Me Too movement against sexual violence has been the target of aggressive censorship. 
Take the heavy-handed reaction to Chinese tennis star Peng Shuai's Weibo post last November 2nd, accusing China's former vice premier Zhang Gaoli of sexual assault. Peng Shuai's post was deleted within half an hour, and she herself disappeared for weeks, only to reemerge in a series of undoubtedly coerced appearances coinciding with Beijing's Winter Olympics. We are about to mark the seventh anniversary of the Chinese government's jailing of five women's rights activists in March 2015 for planning to commemorate International Women's Day by handing out stickers against sexual harassment on subways and buses. Since then, feminist activists have tapped into the broad discontent felt by Chinese women and developed a level of influence that is highly unusual for any social movement in China since 1989. Even though the government persecutes activists, shuts down women's rights and LGBTQ rights centers, and censors feminist social media content, China's feminist networks have actually grown in recent years instead of being wiped out. The shrinking space for civil society in China makes it even more extraordinary that a feminist movement is able to survive at all. While prominent male human rights activists have emerged over the years, very few Chinese citizens knew about them or could relate to their abstract goals. By contrast, feminist activists today take up causes that have broad resonance with young women and LGBTQ people across China. Issues such as sexual violence, intimate partner violence, and gender discrimination. China is an autocracy with no press freedom, no internet freedom or freedom of assembly, and effectively no rule of law. Yet when feminist activists organize around issues that affect the personal lives of millions of ordinary women, even the all-powerful male-dominated Chinese Communist Party struggles to quash the movement. Thank you again for inviting me to testify. Thank you. And we'll now turn to Mr. Halegua. Chairman Merkley, Co-Chair McGovern, members of the commission, good morning. <clears throat> and thank you for the opportunity to testify before you on this important topic. I was asked to address the subject of sexual harassment in China. My testimony draws upon my nearly 20 years of studying Chinese labor issues. Last summer, I published a report on workplace gender-based violence and harassment in China, which describes the current state of Chinese law and practice, and also makes recommendations to the Chinese government, Chinese employers, and global brands on how to better comply with international standards. The full report is attached to my written testimony. Today, I will share a few high-level findings from my research. And I will start with my basic conclusion. It is my view that in recent years, China has in fact made important rhetorical commitments and taken some positive legislative steps towards eliminating sexual harassment. However, there has not yet been sufficient action by officials, courts, or employers to realize those commitments. In practice, Chinese women still routinely suffer sexual harassment at work and have little hope of obtaining meaningful redress. In terms of prevalence, like in many countries, sexual harassment remains a serious problem in China. While survey results vary, one study by the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences from the 1990s found that 84% of female workers reported being harassed. So what has been China's response? At the international level, China recently supported the adoption of ILO Convention 190, on the elimination of violence and harassment in the world of work, which seeks to create a zero tolerance environment for sexual harassment. China even agreed that adopting a convention was preferable to a non-binding resolution. However, since Convention 190 was adopted in 2019, it has not yet been ratified by China. Domestically, China continues to approve its legislation. In 2020, like Congressman McGovern mentioned, China adopted a new civil code that included a provision specifically on sexual harassment. However, while the provision establishes clear liability for individual harassers and requires employers to take measures to prevent sexual harassment, it still does not create any legal liability for employers when they fail to do so. 
Turning to the implementation of these laws, there is evidence that some Chinese employers are taking sexual harassment more seriously. More employers are adopting sexual harassment policies, and there is a considerable number of court cases involving employees who have been fired after the company found that they engaged in sexual harassment. Far more troubling, though, is the very small number of sexual harassment victims that ever bring a case in court. Only six of the 83 sexual harassment court cases decided between 2018 and 2020 involve victims bringing lawsuits against their harassers. Moreover, victims who do sue rarely win. And if they do, the remedies are paltry, sometimes just a few hundred dollars or maybe just an apology. What's worse, sexual harassment victims who complain often face retaliation. It is also common for them to be sued for defamation by the alleged harasser. Indeed, far more cases are brought against sexual harassment victims than by these victims. One female worker who published an online account of being forcibly kissed, groped, and undressed by her supervisor was later ordered to pay the equivalent of 1,800 US dollars for hurting the supervisor's feelings. Already in this culture of silence, very few victims are willing to come forward and complain. If there continues to be little to gain from filing a complaint, but a great deal to lose, it is unlikely that more victims will come forward. So what can be done? In closing, I will just mention a few recommendations from the more comprehensive list in my report. First, the Chinese government should explicitly make employers liable for failing to prevent or address sexual harassment, should modify evidentiary rules that make it difficult for victims to prevail in court, and should protect victims from retaliation and defamation claims. Chinese employers should establish procedures to investigate and resolve complaints, and global brands should ensure Chinese partners have such mechanisms in place. And the US government should commend China for the steps it has taken thus far, but encourage it to do more to harmonize its domestic law and practice with the most recent international standards. Thank you all again for your attention to this important set of issues. I look forward to answering any questions that you have. Uh, thank you, Mr. Halegua. And now uh, we turn to Ms. Fong. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman McGovern, Chairman Merkley, and members of the commission. I appreciate this opportunity to testify on the impact of China's population planning policies and the effect it has had on women in China and beyond. Now, the one-child policy began in 1980. It has shaped China's population planning policies for well over 30, uh, 30 plus years. And then it was replaced in rapid succession with the two-child policy in 2016 and then the three-child policy in 2021. Now, this sudden about change that went from limiting births to boosting births was a result of the ruinous consequences of this inhumane policy. Um, in short, it created a, a population in China that was very unbalanced. Too male, too old, too few. When I say too male, what do I mean? There are 30 million more men than women in China, and that's about the population of Australia. When I say too old, that means you have a shrinking workforce and you have more retirees in China than you have the population of Western Europe. Um, and so what does this all mean for women in China? Well, Mao may have said that women bear up half the sky, but as far as the one-child policy and the consequences of this, women have borne far more than their share of the burden on this. We'll start with the one-child policy first. As a journalist in a Wall Street Journal, my years reporting in China, and while researching on the book, I spoke to many, many women who recounted tales of being forced to have abortions, some as late as seven months. I spoke to uh, officials who described how they cornered and chased women like prey, pregnant women. And I spoke to many, many mothers who had very heartbreaking stories to tell about being forced into acts of abandonment and infanticide, killing their own children, all to conform with the one-child policy. Now, of course, there's a switch to the two and three child policy, but even so, these have inflicted new wounds on women. Now, for example, this whole move to boost births in China is done to ask women of China to shore up the shrinking workplace. 
but they themselves are now being forced to contend with problems in the workplace. Since the introduction of the two-child policy, Human Rights Watch has documented a rise in pregnancy-related discrimination against women in the workplace. Employers now fear that women uh, might take two or three lots of maternity leave instead of only one during the one-child era. And so some companies have sought to avoid this through job ads or interviews or workplace treatment that discriminate against women with no children, women with just one child, or simply women in general. Women have been fired for getting pregnant, they've had their pay dog, they've been asked to sign agreements that pledge, pledging not to have children. And while such practices are illegal under Chinese law, the enforcement is lax, and redress and compensation so few that these practices largely remain unchecked. Elsewhere as well, while of course it is much, easy, much, hard, uh, much easier to use force to prevent women from having children, it does not mean that the Chinese government isn't taking that same approach, stick versus carrot, to try and boost births. And how this is shaping up is in the form of growing curbs on divorce and abortion. These are both human rights abuses. Last month, authorities said it would reduce unplanned pregnancies and abortions among adolescents and single women. Now, this follows tightened overall restrictions on abortion in general that began in 2018. And also, there have been reports of a clampdown on male vasectomies. Now, authorities say these moves are motivated by welfare concerns, but such um, you know, uh, explanations have been met with both suspicion and, in some cases, derision from the Chinese public. Uh, given the state's long history of coercive birth, practice, uh, birth practices, and it's also, of course, important to note at this point that there still continue to be coercive practices uh, for many Uyghurs in China with uh, forced sterilizations and women held in camps, uh, of which we will hear more of in a bit. Um, last but not least, uh, it is not only the women of China who have borne the brunt of Beijing's uh, population planning policies. The one-child policy has created a huge shortage of women, and hence a surge in bride trafficking in China, as well as from countries across the region, including Myanmar, North Korea, Cambodia, and Pakistan. Human Rights Watch has documented how hundreds of women and girls in Myanmar have been sold to Chinese families for anywhere between 3,000 to 13,000 US dollars. And once purchased, they are pressured to produce babies as quickly as possible. Now, you have heard the case of the woman in chains uh, who was held and um, and, and forced to bear something like eight children. This went viral in the, uh, in the weeks before the Beijing Olympics and threatened to derail the feel-good stories of the Olympics. This is a signal or a representation of some of the ongoing concerns with human trafficking. Now, um, there is a whole host of recommendations that I have submitted in my, rec uh, in my written recommendations. I won't go into it at detail at this point. I think it suffice to say at this point that it is almost unimaginable to think that at this point that any government should be in a business of regulating, making, or forcing women to uh, choose how many children they should have. It needs to stop. Thank you. Thank you very much for your work and for your testimony. And now we turn to Ms. Tersunai. Delighted to have you and, and appreciate your willingness to share your your your your knowledge and your experience. Assalamualaikum. <laughs> Vatnamdiki Kendashram no Bishin Utwatan Zuman, Aunt Spurs to Irish Kendigam, then Sladen Kupe. Behman Natterman. Assalam Lakum. I am very thankful that you have given me this opportunity to talk about what I have been through and what has happened to my people. I am very grateful for the opportunity to speak today. Mina Ingustam Yasubumal Ruchin, Hazbera Han Manichin. Um, due to my English skills 
and due to limited time, now my translator will read my remarks to you. Thank you, Chair Merkley, and thank you, Co-Chair McGowan. I am very grateful for the opportunity to testify and to tell the world about my experience and the experience of Uyghur women. It is painful to speak about my experiences, but I see it as my duty to be the voice for those who are still in the camps and in prison and those who died in front of my own eyes. I was locked up in camps two different times. The mental and the physical torture I have experienced have left deep scars on my heart. I was taken into a camp for the second time in March 2018 and stayed for nearly one year. We always lived in fear we feared beatings if we could not memorize the propaganda lessons correctly. Every day, we heard screaming and the crying voices. Then it happened to me. Several times, the guards took me out of the cell and into an interrogation room, and they beat me. Once, they took me out in the middle of the night, along with a young woman in her 20s. In addition to police officers, there was a man in a suit wearing a mask. I don't know where he came from. These men raped the young woman. Three police officers raped me as well. They were always taking girls. Sometimes they brought a woman back near the point of death. Some of the women disappeared. I saw some bleed to death with my own eyes. Some lost their minds in the camp. Every time I think about these things, my heart feels like it's been sliced with a dagger. My nightmares make me relive that fear every day. I thank the CECC commissioners for speaking out for Uyghur women. We are grateful to Congresswoman Paxton for advocating for Ms. Gulmira Imin. We are very grateful for the resolution condemning genocide and the forced labor bill that passed in December. I ask you to do more. Please do more to accept Uyghur refugees. I came to the U.S. with the help of the U.S. government and the Uyghur Human Rights Project. There are more people like me who managed to escape China, but they are still afraid to speak. Living in neighboring countries, they are still living in fear of being deported to China at any time. Please also investigate, that, investigate what can be done to help Uyghur asylum seekers. I know many Uyghurs who arrived in the US before the crackdown in 2017, which is already five years ago and they still have not received their asylum interview. The U.S. is do, doing so much because of your great sympathy for the Uyghurs. Can you also investigate why so many Uyghurs are waiting for years for a decision on asylum? I also hope the Congress can do more to help Uyghur torture survivors to get medical care and counseling. My nightmares and the mental anguish are constant. Camp survivors like me need help for our extreme trauma. Other Uyghur Americans are also suffering terrible mental trauma. Finally, I want to ask for more support for human rights groups and Radio Free Asia to do more pro programs to help women who are victims of the Chinese government's atrocities. For example, I listen to Radio Free Asia Uyghur service every day. I hope there can be more news stories about women in, in the genocide and information about how Uyghur women can survive our mental torment. And the more stories about the achievements of a strong Uyghur and the Kazakh women can help give us inspiration and hope for the future. 
Thank you again for inviting me. Uh, thank you so much for your, your testimony uh, about these conditions. Thank you to all of our witnesses. We're going to turn to a period of, uh, of, of questions now. And Ms. Terse and I, uh, let me begin with you. Could you help for those who are seeking to understand your experience, whether the camp you were put into uh, was a strategy by the Chinese government to uh, separate women and prevent them from having children? Was it a strategy for forced labor? Were you forced to labor? And um, at what point and why did the government release you from the camp? I don't know what kind of strategy that Chinese government wish to implement, but the one thing that I know and it's clear is the Chinese government wants to, uh, for Uyghur women to not have children. They try to, uh, they impose on sterilization and every woman. The just the main thing that I know that clearly is they want to destroy Uyghur women in different ways. In different ways, the Chinese government tried to separate the families, family members. For example, this picture that I am just showing you, this woman was separated from her children. And in different ways, uh, the only thing is they just try to destroy the Uyghur families and the Uyghur women. And if you could, at what point were you released from the, the camp? And um, I know you were, you were admitted or put into a camp a second time. What was the strategy of the Chinese government why why were you released Men ulanın məqsədini bilməyəm fakat mənim bildiğim yol düşüm Qazaxstanda boğalıq üçün mən qualıq bədi and <laughs> Um, I don't know what purpose the Chinese government has in its mind, but the, the only thing that I know that um, because my husband, he was living in Kazakhstan, and he advocated for me. Um, I have seen that you know the Chinese authority they have showed me that my husband was campaigning for my release from the camp. And he was uh, holding my Chinese ID card and talking about my set and saying that, that I am innocent and I should be released from the camp. And my understanding is because of my husband and he campaigned for me 
uh, from Kazakhstan, and that's why Chinese government had to release me. Uh, thank you. No one should ever have to go through what you endured and what other Uyghur and Turkic Muslim women are experiencing. You are a voice for so many, and you're doing a, a great service by helping shine a, a light on this inhumanity, uh, in this uh, uh, strategy of uh, genocide being conducted by the Chinese government. So th thank you. I'm going to turn now to uh, Dr. Uh, Fincher, and um, I was... Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Um, thank you very much. Thank you for giving this opportunity and the, our people back home. Many people very hopeful that um, the American government will help us. They are really looking forward and really hopeful that you will support bigger people. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Fincher. I was very struck by your description of the patriarchal authoritarian views of uh, Xi Jinping and that the subjugation of women as critical for the survival of the Communist Party, which is an interesting way to, to uh, characterize Xi Jinping's views as, as subjugation is critical for the survival of, of the party. I do certainly understand your, your, your, your follow-up in which you talk about the elements of Confucianism and the strategy of a uh, male-dominated uh, uh, family and the and belief that uh, uh, China will thrive with obedient wives. But why, why is the subjugation of women critical to the survival of the party? Why do you put it that way? Uh. Thank you for your question, um, Senator Merkley. Um, it is multifaceted. Um, so Chinese, the Chinese government faces all of these economic problems, the shrinking of the workforce, aging of the population, the sex ratio imbalance, um, which is related to a, a lot of tens of millions more men who are considered to be a grave threat to political stability because they are not able to find wives, um, domestic violence. Um, the Chinese government passed uh, an anti-domestic violence law in 2016, I believe largely to make itself look like a more responsible uh, global power, but that law has basically not been enforced. I, and after many years of doing research on women in China, more than a decade, I've come to the conclusion that basically the Chinese government wants the violence against women to continue as long as it is happening within the home. And so it is important for, according to this old Confucian ideology, which is now being uh, resuscitated in Chinese state media today. There is such an emphasis on everybody playing their proper uh, role within the family that is very hierarchical. So there's this aggressive propaganda about how women need to be uh, wives and mothers, very docile and obedient within the home. Um, so women then take over the harmony within the home, and the, the Communist Party continues to emphasize in its propaganda how a harmonious family is the basic cell of society, that, that as long as the violence is contained within the home, um, then that violence is not likely to be directed at the state. Um, so that's one of, one of the ways in which I believe um, that the subjugation of women is, is very important. I mean, if you compare China with uh, surrounding countries like Japan, for example, Japan is also highly patriarchal, and yet uh, they've adopted this Abenomics 
uh, policy of trying to encourage more women's participation in the workforce, and they've actually succeeded in raising female labor force participation rates. But in China, we see the absolute opposite where female labor force participation is falling. Um, there is no effort um, on the part of the government to, uh, to decrease or uh, reverse that trend in any way. Um, China is the only country, I believe, in the entire world where labor, female labor force participation is falling. Um, and the gender income gap is increasing. And, and why is it that there is such little female political representation? Not only is it abysmally low, it's actually falling within the Central Committee. There are so many different signs. Um, and the crackdown, the severe crackdown on this extraordinary feminist movement ever since 2015, why is it that China's leaders are so threatened by feminism? Um, it's in, in part, in large part, because marriage rates are falling, uh, birth rates are falling. Young women today, particularly college-educated young women, do not want to marry um, or even have one child, let alone two. And so they are, in, in uh, advocating for the emancipation of women, these feminists are actually posing a real threat to uh, the the whole agenda of the Communist Party. And uh, there are many ways in which this basically threatens the ability of China's leaders to control the entire population. I am now way over my time, uh, which I'm shocked about. How did seven minutes go by so quickly? To, uh, I apologize to my uh, colleagues. And we'll turn to Representative McGovern. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Ms. Ms. Fong, uh, you, uh, you testify that the, and I quote, Chinese states switch to purportedly pro-natal policies have inflicted new wounds on women, end quote. Uh, you recommend that the Chinese government uh, fully respect reproductive rights to stop regulating women's bodies uh, and provide free ac access to safe and legal abortion and contraception. Um, you know, we're all against China's human rights abuses, um, uh, against its heavy-handed intrusion into the lives and bodies of women. And I think it's important that, uh, that we not only publicly oppose China's denial of, uh, well, I think it's important that, we, that when we, we're talking about opposing China's denial of basic reproductive rights, that we're talking about that, whether they are coercive antenatal policies or pronatal policies. Uh, you know, the, the abuse to women, the, the taking away of women's rights is the heavy-handed role that the Chinese government is playing in saying, you can do this and you can't do that, or you can do this. Can you expand on your recommendation? I'm sorry, could you um, clarify that question? I guess what, I, what I'm trying to say is, is kind of reemphasizing the importance um, that uh, when we talk about opposing China's heavy-handed approach in dealing with women, that it is important that we are talking about their, not only their co coercive antenatal policies, but also their pronatal policies. And I, if you could just maybe comment on that. Yes. I mean, I think China is unusual among uh, many countries. I mean, China is not the only country that is facing, um, you know, falling birth rates. This is um, uh, this is a reality in most modern societies where women are educated and in the workforce and having smaller families and delaying uh, when they start uh, reproducing uh, as they go on and, and have college. China, however, is unusual in that it's tr adopting very different tactics from the rest of the world in terms of trying to uh, increase uh, you know, family size. It isn't uh, spending a lot of money on um, ancillary services like childcare, uh, schooling, all the things that are necessary. Uh, when you're in the business of promoting equality for women um, and, uh, and promoting um, equal, uh, say, uh, um, you know, parental rights in uh, the workplace, it is unusual in that respect. And I think this goes towards Dr. Hong Finch's point. It isn't so much about births. It is about control. Thank you. No, I, I appreciate that. I, I, I just I think it's just important that um, that that point be emphasized because it is about control, um, and women should decide whether they want to 
marry, whether they want to have children, whether they want to have one child or five children, whatever. Or no uh, children. Yeah, or no children. That is up to the woman, not up to the government, uh, to decide how a woman uh, deals with her life. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Um, Halegua, um, women or men who suffer sexual harassment or abuse are often burdened with mental trauma from the experience. Uh, does the Chinese system, whether legal or social, provide, um, you know, uh, psychosocial or other support for those who suffer trauma? Uh, is mental health covered under the Chinese health system or readily available? Thank you, Tom. Uh, it's not a subject that I'm... Is your mic on? Thank you, Congressman. Um, it's not a subject that I'm particularly expert on. I will say in the legal system, in looking at sexual harassment cases, and part of our study was to analyze every court case we could find that mentions the word sexual harassment. Uh, what did become clear in trying to figure out you know, when courts would actually award damages, for instance, to sexual harassment victims, often required that you know, they have some kind of psychological um, evaluation and there be actual documented sort of psychological trauma before they would be willing to uh, award some kind of damages to that victim. In terms of the adequacy of services from the things I've read, uh, suggests that certainly they're falling short in terms of uh, providing these problems. I think a big piece of it is many people never really want to come out and complain and talk about what happened to them. Right. There's obviously certain stigmas attached uh, to being a victim of sexual harassment, and oftentimes it leads to problems at work. Right? You have become the problem if you complain about sexual harassment and could lead to problems in one's own family uh, or you know, social groups, the stigma that comes with being someone who complains about sexual harassment. So a lot of people aren't really coming forward and seeking out the help um, for the trauma that they might have suffered. Thank you. Dr. Fincher, you testify that China's feminist networks have grown in recent years, uh, despite uh, the overall trend and restrictions on civil society. To what do you attribute this dynamic? Um, is there a way that those of us outside China can support the movement? Um, and is there a way that we can hurt? Uh, because one of the, the struggles we always have uh, when it comes to supporting human rights defenders and those struggling for their human rights is, um, you know, how, despite our best intentions, that we don't do something that makes it more difficult for them. Uh, thank you for your question, Chairman McGovern. Um, there are many reasons uh, why the feminist movement is so transformative today. One, so at, at its core, there's a very radical political feminist movement. Those political activists at the very core are extremely savvy um, organizers. They're very imaginative. They're located in many different places. Uh, it's a rather large community. It has increased significantly since the jailing of the so-called Feminist Five in 2015. And so this core uh, radical base of Chinese feminists is actually part of a global diaspora of Chinese feminists as well, who keep the momentum of the movement going. It is very different from, um, you know, these isolated, uh, rather, in the past, male heroes who are very well known, but then the Chinese government may kick them out of the country and then they lose all relevance. This is a, the, the movement does not rely on a single heroic leader. Um, it, it, and it has become, the mainstream uh, ideas about just uh, speaking out against widespread sexism and misogyny in Chinese society, it has become so mainstream. These are very popular ideas now. They've caught on among millions and millions of not just young women, mm -hmm. but I mean LGBTQ people, young men, there are many allies. So these are ideas that really hundreds of millions of people in China uh, can endorse. And so it's popular. Uh, there's a, a radical core. The, the activists themselves, the most active feminists, are themselves persecuted. Sometimes they're jailed. Some of them are in jail right now. Um, what can we do to help? Well, uh, 
certainly I would agree as well with Dorsen and I, Zia Wooden, in that the US should uh, do much more to provide a refuge for those fleeing persecution um, in China. And I, I know that those who managed to make it to the US still have a lot of difficulty. In fact, I've helped a lot of these people with their visas. They have problems with visas, problems staying here. Um, we can uh, open our doors and welcome more of these people fleeing persecution and help give them the resources they need to make a new life in the US when it is really impossible for them to live back in China. And the thing is that um, this communication, there's a lot of, because of the internet, of course there's no internet freedom in China, but the, the global diaspora of Chinese feminists and Uyghurs, I might add, um, it has, has become so large. There's a lot of communication among these people. And so we can provide more resources for those who have fled China, who've come to the US. Right. Thank you. Congressman Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to our panelists uh, and uh, Tersene, uh All of our hearts and, and and prayers are for you as you have suffered so much. And and uh, this commission and all of us on this panel are absolutely committed to trying to end this genocide and to provide some relief, especially as you pointed out the mental trauma that you suffer uh, because of your terrible abuse that you suffered at the hands of the uh, Chinese Communist Party. So. Thank you for having the courage uh, to come and testify. And again, to keep the focus of what Xi Jinping is doing um, in Xinjiang uh, uh, very much, uh, uh, it, it, you know, so, so that we're all focused on that. So thank you. I'd like to, you know, uh, Mei Fang, uh, you know, appreciate the comments you made about the, uh, uh, the uh, fact that some 30 million men um, frankly, are single. Uh, I remember I chaired hearings at which the predictions were being made 15 years ago that by 2020, 20 million men would not be able to find wives because um, uh, of the extermination of the girl child through sex selection abortion uh, as a direct consequence of the one child per couple policy. So thank you for reminding us of, of that ongoing um, uh, uh, terrible debacle that has occurred. Uh, and also your point about how uh, the officials, how they, they chased pregnant women like prey. Uh, again, I have chaired 75 congressional hearings on human rights abuses in China, offered countless number of resolutions and amendments uh, and bills on the issue of forced abortion, uh, always with an idea that there are two victims involved, the mother uh, who is being horribly mistreated and the baby who is being dismembered or killed. I would disagree with you uh, when you talked about uh, abortion protecting unborn children as a human rights abuse um, on page two of your testimony. Um, I believe that, you know, the abuse is when a child is literally dismembered, uh, killed by dismemberment or chemical poisoning. Um, you know, we know more about the magnificent life of an unborn child now than ever before. Ultrasound has shattered the myth that somehow an unborn child is not human and alive. Uh, we know that the baby uh, has a wake cycle, grows and develops, and birth is merely an event, just an event, an important one, but an event that happens in the life of a child. So our protections need to extend prior to birth uh, to ensure that these children uh, are not, as I said, dismembered or chemically poisoned. We know that children uh, before birth feel pain at least to 20 weeks, and now the evidence is strongly suggesting that as they're being dismembered, uh, at 15 weeks, they feel that too. Uh, and until they are dead, they feel that pain in a most excruciating way. Now, some could just dismiss that or trivialize it or ignore it, uh, but that's a terrible reality. Bernard Nathanson, the founder of NARAL and one of the leading pro-abortionists in the 1970s, uh, he said, I've come to the agonizing conclusion I've presided over 60,000 deaths he was the head of the biggest abortion clinic in New York City. And what caused him to change? Dealing with unborn children as patients in need of a blood transfusion and some other kind of benign intervention uh, to enhance their lives, including those with spina bifida. So 
Um, so I disagree with you on that, but I would like to ask you on the issue of sex selection abortion, whether or not you support sex selection abortion. And I say that because the terrifying impact on China and on Asia uh, continues to be felt uh, to this day. Uh, I had a hearing in 2016, I had several hearings. One of them uh, was with um, um, uh, Mira Wiesenstahl, who said in 2013, that over 160 million um, missing girls in Asia, 160 million, uh, as a direct result of sex selection abortion. Uh, almost none of them were killed at birth. They were killed after an ultrasound revealed at about fifth month, the fifth month that that child happens to be a girl. And because she is a girl, she is exterminated. 160 million. And then she went on to say that equates with the total number of all the women and girl children living in the United States of America. So every woman you ever see, my dear wife, my daughters, my, every woman in this country, add them all up. That's how many are missing as a result of sex, sex selection abortion uh, in Asia. And of course, that's not just China, but it's Asia. But China uh, is missing tens of millions as a direct result. So my first question to you is about sex selection abortion. Uh, do you support it? Uh, I mean, the devastating impact on the girl child. I believe that, that, that, that not only violence against women, but also uh, uh, uh, discrimination against women starts in the womb. If you tell uh, uh, or have a policy, or not you, but, but a country where the, the girl child is construed to be less than um, uh, uh, human and, and should not continue living simply because she's a girl child, uh, that is a terrible human rights abuse. But I would appreciate your thoughts on that. Thank you very much for that. Um, and something that you may not know about my personal history is that if there was sex selective abortion available at the time when I was born, I probably would not be born. I am one of five daughters in a very traditional Chinese household. My father was one of 16 out of 18 sons. They clearly cared a lot about sons. So on that position, at least, I certainly see the value of girls and I certainly see why it is a problem, not just in China, but in many parts of Asia and beyond, where uh, there has this been a long patriarchal system valuing boys and, and how that has created all sorts of evils and problems, particularly as we see in China with sex, like, sex selective abortions and gender imbalances and elsewhere. However, I think also as part of this culture and need to value women. We need to value women's choices. And I will say in short that while it takes a village to raise a child, it does not take a village to determine a woman's choices on how many children she has, if she has children at all, or any of things of those sorts. So those are my thoughts on that perspective. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. If I could ask you further, if you would, um, you know, one of the things that I brought out, and again, I go back to 1983 when I first heard about this issue, um, um, and I've worked with a number of NGOs. A lot of the NGOs wouldn't do a thing. I remember arguing with Amnesty International for years, why were they silent on forced abortion in China? Uh, there were people in 1985, uh, there was a hearing held right here in the Capitol, at which the argument was, it's all over. The high tides are over. And I said, absolutely not. Then Michael Wiesenthal, um, not Wiesenthal, um, uh, uh, Weitzkopf, uh, did a three-part series for the Washington Post in which he documented the horrific abuse of the one-child-per-couple policy. And then amendments were offered by me and others that said any group that supports or co-manages it, including the UN Population Fund, should be disqualified from getting funds. We want no complicity whatsoever in this abuse of women and children. But one of the mainstays throughout all of this, besides, again, women being forcibly aborted, was that all single women you know, any unmarried woman uh, would be also forcibly aborted. And I've met with several myself, uh, both in China and others here, part of the diaspora, some of the lucky ones who got refugee status. And I'm just wondering, you know, if, what is the status of that now? Can an unwed mother uh, continue her pregnancy to term? Thank you for that question. Insofar as um, the status of unwed mothers in China and their difficulties obtaining all sorts of reproductive services, and it can be both in a direction. Um, now, previously in the past, um, abortions have been 
quite um, easily obtained in China. We both, of course, know many people who have used it actually as a form of contraception. Now, now that has appears to be reversing now because of the Chinese government's stance to encourage births, at least among the Han population. Like I said, last month, there were new uh, regulations and that appeared to be winding that back insofar as uh, giving abortion services for unmarried women and adolescent women. Now, in either of these cases, what it amounts to is coercion and a limitation on women's choices, and that is never a good thing. And as to your uh, question on human rights groups and what they have said, I think, in principle, um, human rights groups are all about oppo the opposition of force, the opposition of forcing a woman to have a child, the opposition of forcing a woman to have sex, the opposition of forcing women in general. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that so much, and um, again, we do have a fundamental disagreement on on the unborn child. I think they are worthy of protection, and you know I, I've. Thank you, Congressman. Of, we are. I'll just finish up real quick, if you don't mind, Mr. Chairman. Um, a number of women who are post-abortive uh, and wish that someone would have said, you know, that much agony often follows uh, her who's had an abortion. It's all about you know reconciliation and and hoping that they can get back on their lives, but uh, it is a tragic loss of life. Uh, so thank you, and I, I yield back. Thank you. Congresswoman Steele. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all the witnesses coming out today, and I'm just so grateful. Um, I think it's appalling that the CCP refuses to call Russia's recent actions an invasion, and it is also appalling that Chairman Xi Jinping is standing with Putin. At this too long list of actions by CCP to cheat and abuse the global rules-based system and another example of their human rights atrocities. As we speak, the CCP still limits women's access to leadership positions and is virtually run and controlled by men. The CCP steals large volumes of information and censors its own people and information. The rec recent vid video of a chained mother of eight and the censorship of those who posted about it in China and sought additional information is a horrific examples of the CCP's ongoing abuse of its, its citizens. A study by Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and the Kachin Women's Association Thailand estimated that about 21,000 women and girls from northern Myanmar were forced into marriage in just one province in China from 2013 to 2017. The United States must stand and fight for the women and girls of China who are being oppressed and prosecuted by CCP women should not be prosecuted for speaking out against human rights abuses. Having said that, to all the witnesses, anybody wants to answer, please help me to answer this. My first question is, China's labor force is declining, decades long birth policies that we've been talking about today, and its aging politician will weigh on its economy. The CCP allows for gender inequality in education and health. What can the United States and major companies to, to give these women voices and equality? And any uh, witnesses? I'll, let that, I'll uh, take a first stab at that. Um, one of my great frustrations and just observing the international response to abuses by the Chinese government um, is that all of these multinational corporations seem to only be thinking about their bottom line. And so I don't know what the US government can do to affect the stance of these kinds of corporations or international organizations like the International Olympic Committee, for example, um, perhaps go through the United Nations, um, but of course, you know, the U.S. government can uh, come up with certain policies, perhaps sanctions, uh, but I, I see those as having somewhat limited 
impact when you have so many American corporations that simply don't care about doing the right thing? So this is a very tricky question. Um, and I don't know who else wants to jump in. Actually, I sent a letter out with 17 other Congress members during, you know, right before the Olympic ask all these corporations, they're spending billions of dollars on advertising. And I asked them to spend just a little bit more, uh, you know, let whole world know that human rights violation in China, that's what's happening. And I didn't get any responses from these 17 corporations. I was very, very disappointed. So if anybody wants to answer, that's good. But uh, I can go into. Uh, I can jump into one here very oh, briefly here. Sure. I think this is a one um, possibility of a sort of a very simple request and a, a possibly doable. U.S. companies do a lot of business in China, as we know. Uh, U.S. companies partner with Chinese companies. I think one uh, good ask is to ask them to stop participating in these discriminatory workplace practices against women in China who make up quite a significant amount of their workforce um, and their employees either by contract or through their partnerships. That is something that we can ask and we can push for that I think that, um, it, that would make sense uh, for U.S. companies. Ask that. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. And my second question is, after the events of tennis star Peng Shui Zuevo, Chinese women must be more fearful than ever about speaking out against the abuses. What is moral and day-to-day -day life in long-term moral for women and women in China? And what is moral and day-to-day -day life in long-term moral for women in China? Um, I, I would like to answer your previous question. I'm sorry, I was a bit late. Go ahead, thank you. Nimo Hazar, Ms. Bolbuma Majbury and Gekke, Ms. Nolan, Ashlager, and Ipket Vatana, and Ash Uskus and Blanku again, Bolbuma Hazar, Dom Nashwado. Men Amerika hukumatiga daydagani chuqum shuni birinchi to'xtatish kerak. Faqat hozir chiqarib qo'ygan qonunni hech qachon Xitoy uni ilik og'ini yo'q, hech qachon to'xtatqini yo'q, yana davomlashtiradi. Men ishni men Amerika hukumati uni chuqum to'xtatmaydi, to'xtata olmaydi. Bir ishdan qoni men bugun shuni degim va Amerika hukumatiga hozir 6 yil bo'ldi biz qaqshavatimiz, davatimiz Çokum biz için hakikaten bir iş kılışınlarını ümit kılmadı. Çünkü kolonlardan kilo da öz vaxtı da sizler Avrabiya kadarını kutuldurup çıxdanlar şu yedin. Çünkü başka bütün uyğurlar bilgi sizlerin bu yedin kolonlarının bir hakikaten Kıhtay'a bir işini kılalaydığınlarla onlara küçüklerine yetip. Sizler şu, şu çağda mi hazır? 6 yılından yakımını bu vatkan 40 yılını Kıhtay'ı toktu tutup koyunu yok. Sizlerin de vatkan kanını olan hiç kaçan o yana ilik olmayı vatıdı, kağılıkını kıvatıdı, yana mecburi emgekke işlet vatıdı. Uyghurlan yana oxşaşlı qırğınçılıq qılıb atdı. Şunun üçün sizlə əməli bir iş qılış olan ümid qılma Amerika hökumətinə mə hayran qılat məyə qığınla kəməyib atamdı. Mən bəzi şunu oylapma qalmə. Ya küçünlə yitidi, yitib turub qılmayıb atqan dəgil isib qalmə bəzi rəs mən özəm şəxsi bir özəmin məş fikrim. Qalamğı bəzi açdı kildi. Mən Xitayda toğa vaxtımda maşda oylaytdım. Çünki Amerikanın qanchilik kuchliligini bilmiz bir. Bu dedi bütün uyğurlar. Çünki sizlər öz vaqtida Ashda Abiyani qadrını qutuldurğan, Qazaqstanda meni qutuldurib kəldən qanchilik adamlarni qutuldurub atdı. Sizlər kishilik huquqda birinchi o'rinda tursizlər. I I just would like to answer the previous question. The forced labor issue, the forced labor in Uyghur region is still continuing. Um, many uh, the detainers from the uh, camps, concentration camps now uh, move it to factories to work as a cheap labor. So it is still continuing. I really wish that um, US government uh, do something to stop it, uh, implement the end forced labor policy act and just to do practical, act, take practical action. Um, I believe the power of America because we, the Uyghurs are really uh, believe it in the power, the ability that America can do. Uh, we deeply believe in because the previously the U.S. government were able to save Ms. Rabia Kadir from jail and um, brought her to America. And the later person uh, like myself, I was saved by the America as well, and I was able to live 
uh, from the concentration camps and through Kazakhstan, I came to the United States as well. The, all of the Uyghur people are deeply believing um, if American government wants to do something, they are able to do so. So that's, that's our hope. I mean, sometimes I really think that it's been six years that we've been talking about the genocide is happening in Uyghur region, and we keep talking about um, it's already there. And my just a personal hope, that personal wish, um, the Americas should take action and stop the genocide and stop the forced labor in Uyghur region. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, my time is up. Or do you think I can hear for the second question? Thank you very much, uh, Congresswoman. We do have uh, two more members of Congress waiting. And so I think we should proceed and then come back to you if, if you're able to stay with us for a second round. Thank you. Yes. And I'll now recognize Senator Ossoff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to our panel for your powerful testimony today. Uh, Ms. Ziawuddin, thank you for your courage and your testimony uh, and for sharing your experiences. Um, I'd like to ask you, uh, what about uh, the systematic mistreatment of women in detention camps in Xinjiang? Uh, does the U.S. Congress need to know that you've not yet had the opportunity to share today? the mistreatment that women face at the concentration in intimate camps is extreme and sometimes I don't really wish to think about it or it's, it's just really scary. I am one of the witness to those mistreatments. Um, I personally have witnessed that a 21 years old girl was raped and also some unmarried girls were sterilized and some women were died from bleeding. I have witnessed all this. The, the f f mistreatment towards a vegan woman is very systematic. It's very popular and it's always there. So I, I ju it's just horrifying to think about it. One unmarried girl was pleading, saying that, look, I have not even got married yet. Why would you do operation onto my uterus? Ms. Ziawuddin, thank you for your courageous testimony and uh, for establishing for the historical record uh, and for the information of the U.S. Congress, your testimony with respect to these ongoing atrocities. Uh, with my brief remaining time, uh, I would humbly invite you to uh, make any comments uh, that you believe should be heard by the broader American public, by the American people. Um. Azir 
kişilik hukuk diyeceğim, mençilik mi ayalların ki, benim biz ayalların takat mı yok o azır, şeyim piyano kuvvet kime, uç aşkar kişilik hukuk diyeceğim, depsen de kuvvet oldu. Niçin şunu uzudun uzun, niçin bunda kanun örmet kumaysa dep, dimeydi kanı gayran, dis dis bu manda çok örmet kum, dünya da azır, kançilik bu kit bağın hava kar yok yani öz bilgini kuvvet oldu. Şu aşka Amerika kim hakik, hatay hükümeti ya çok mu bariş kalışın ümit kuma birdim dişini. Biz ne bunda depsendi olup ayalların oku, bütün ballanın hemsin oku kon depsendi patam bir devletin bu dünyada mevcut buluşun çok mu kişilik oku ne bunda örnek örnek kumaydı kan onda komünist partiyanın bu dünyada yok bu bitkiyi işine kalmış şunu dişine uç kaşkar yüzdeki hatay hükümetinin emeli bir iş kılışını mutlumla Amerika hükümeti kılalaydı da işte ben kumayı vatsla lakin kılanla ötne kılay kişilik oku bek depsendi bu vatu doğru azır niye çok karab tur vatsla yana yana okşas kıl vatu doğru yana I am begging to American government to take action. Please do more. The human rights violations are the common in China, and China's Communist Party is doing whatever whatever they want to do, despite world's pressure, and um, the, the, just by world watching it. But I really wish that um, if American government. Uh, wish to and it take action, just to take action, do more, because the, we believe that you can do more. Yaxır daydığınım yani bir gəp, mən lagırdı, biz gəmandaq da etdi, aşı bir gəp isim kəldi azı. Biz dünyada, yani çıx bu olsun, 5 yıl, 10 yıllık qamay, biz fəqat bir cüngu digən nəsləm buldu, bə əmmisini, biz dünyanı bir cüngu qıqqılımız. İş kaçan biz Amerika'dan kokup kamerasıyla işinip gitmemle Amerika'da uykurlarını tutup gelimiz, Arabiya kadarını tutup geldik, biz ölgülü vatı da hazır kamap koyduk deyip başta diyen. Şunu oylap kalma biz de rast kokup atam silen ki cüngüden deyip. Ben likin uyadı biz silen pek güçlük deyip oylaydı emmeden. Hazırım şunda oylayma ben hazırımda. Yani ben hiç şunda kuat silen ben aklıma eğren şu açıkla. Ya da işte dedi ya şunda karab durup şunu bir cüngü okulup bütün hemenle cüngü boyusunu dağınla kirakma. Şunda kılamışlar, şunda kılamışlar, şunda kılamışlar bilmeyeyim hemen. Yani hem milyarlı Kıtay'nın, Komünist Partiyanın digini digen bulmadı da, Şi Cengpeyan'la digini kılmadı da. Hiç kim bunun arasını toktutamayı var, bunu gayran. Bana olimpik mi bop getti, yani hiç kim hiç de kılmadınla. Ben şunu gayrı, meylim beni cazalsalar, ben beri bir ölüp buğan edem, ben hata yapıp koysam bir yerde. Bugün nemişken ben bir... Adi pukra okumayan yani sekizinci sınıf okuyan bir ayan, şu an şimdi bir siyaset ne bilmeyi yapıp koyuyordum. Lakin içimden kaynağı otkan nersin de var. Ben keçer onlara kadar yapıp koysam, size hiç de kumayı matla, şeyin bir diğinde buluvat onu cehanda ya nazar. Um, to me, you know, while I was in the camp, the in the camp, the camp officials told us that within five years, uh, the world world can be controlled by China. I mean, I don't know whether the America's scaring from China is nothing practical or nothing action is happening right now. But however, people really believe that America is very strong. I am really sorry if I am saying something wrong because I'm not really a well-educated person, but I don't know how politics works. But I am just as an ordinary woman, I am just uh, speaking out what's came to my mind from what I have witnessed and what I have been through. Um, yes, uh, the world is doing something, but the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese government is still able to do whatever they want to do. Like, for example, we tried to stop the Olympic to happen, but it happened. And we tried to stop many things to happen and stop China's violation against uh, Uyghur people, but it's still happening. So just my question, sometimes I was wonder whether world or America is fearful from the China. And just as Chinese Communist Party said, the world will follow and obey us whatever we do. So I really wish and to see um, action by the American government and by the people. Yeah, there are millions of people that are still in the detentions. I don't know why the world is still watching that what's happening there. Look, those kind of people, they are just among the millions who separate from the family members and still... I'm really sorry if I'm saying something wrong. 
Sometimes just, I just think, are you just looking that we be just disappear from the earth? Cinayetçi çokum cezasını tartış gerek kanun aldı dep oylayma için o için. Bilmeyim ben, oh, hazır ben ümit gibi ümitim üzülüp gitti. Ölümdüm başka nasıl hazır. Dünya bu kadar ümitim üzülüp gitti. Sometimes I lost my hope from the world. Um, I don't know what's happening. Uh, I, I, I just wish to see some action. And I don't wish my people to disappear. Ms. Ziauddin, your testimony today will steal the resolve of the United States and the world to confront these crimes against humanity. And please know that uh, your testimony has been full of courage uh, and that the Congress, the American people and the world uh, are grateful to you and full of respect and admiration for you for speaking out uh, even at personal risk and risk to your family uh, and for sharing your experiences and the experiences of your people with us. I thank you uh, for your testimony. I ask humbly that the interpreter uh, relay this message uh, to the witness uh, prior to uh, returning the microphone to the chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for giving the opportunity. I'm really sorry I got really emotional. Uh, thank you so much for your, your, your passionate testimony, and it makes a difference to have your voice heard, which is exactly why we invited you to join us in this hearing today. Uh, many of us uh, here on this commission, all of us on this commission, are fighting to draw attention to human rights issues in, in China, and certainly at today to focus on the treatment of women, and you've added a great deal to, to that. Uh, conversation so um, and the challenges that that face us in trying to change the situation I will now defer uh, to Congressman Wexton who I believe is uh, awaiting to join us very much mr. chairman and thank you so much I also want to applaud the brave women of China who are speaking out against harassment violence and discrimination Ms. Tersonet especially you I know that it's extremely difficult to have to relive all of the horror that you went through in the camps and every time you come and testify here on the Hill, but it makes a huge difference. And I just want to say thank you so much for everything that you do. We all know the story of Peng Shui. I was honored to lead, lead the resolution in support of Peng, which passed the House unanimously. Her story rightly got a lot of attention, but that's because she's a famous athlete with very famous friends who worried about her. And for every Peng Shui, there are thousands of others who have been disappeared, charged with crimes, and trolled online for speaking out. I want to use some of my time to talk about a woman who is currently serving a life sentence in China, Gulmira Imin. Gulmira and her story were brought to my attention by the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission. Gulmira is a Uyghur Muslim who served as a government employee she was arrested in 2009 after authorities alleged she had organized a protest and leaked state secrets to her husband in Norway. Her family was never notified of her arrest and didn't even know where she was being held until they saw her in a Chinese documentary dressed in prison garb. In 2010, Golmira was sentenced to life in prison after being tortured and forced to sign a confession. She was not allowed to meet with her lawyer until her actual trial date and her appeal was re rejected. She's being held in Xinjiang Women's Prison and is allowed one family visit every three months. And as shocking as heart and heartbreaking as Gulmira's story, it is far from unique. I've heard dozens of similar accounts from people in the Uyghur diaspora just outside of Washington, D.C. in Northern Virginia, where I am, where I represent. And Ms. Tersene, um, assalamu alaikum. It's wonderful to see you again. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Um, I, I do want to thank you again for sharing your heartbreaking story. I'm so glad that you feel safe now enough to to actually come out and 
and tell your story and share it because it's so compelling and it's so important. Now, you talked a little bit in your testimony about the need for the U.S. to accept more, more Uyghur refugees because even if they make it out of China, they occasionally are, are at risk of being sent back to China to face charges if they're in a neighboring country. Can you speak a little bit more about that, please? Mimlerin <gülüyor> Kinlovatkan <gülüyor> Regarding the refugees or asylum seekers, um, personally, I have came to United States. It's been about a year now. And also I have witnessed other Uyghur people in the community that who has uh, problems in having a proper status in America. Uh, for example, because of many Uyghurs, they don't have a proper status in America. Uh, they are unable to uh, uh, give the children to study in the higher education system. And also many families are, they are unable to reunite because uh, they don't have good, uh, uh, enough status. So they are unable to sponsor or bring back other family members that uh, lives in other countries. And for example, there is one person, my friend, uh, Mihrigul Tursun, uh, who is another camp survivor, and she's unable to reunite with her husband because of her status. And even some people, although I don't believe that um, U.S. government will deport any Uyghurs back to China, but still some people fear of deportation back to China. And I know that that's something that's happening in other countries, so that's very concerning to me. And, and that's why I have a bipartisan bill with Vice Chairman Chris Smith and, and also with Representative Deutsch that would grant Uyghurs P2 refugee status here in the US, which would essentially expedite their ability to apply for asylum here in the US. Now I have I have people on my caseload here who have been who have been, you know, in the process of, of trying to, to to clarify their status and get asylum here in the US for for over over eight, ten years. Um, and so, you know, it's it's really, really sad that it's taking them so long to get their, their status and to have that that kind of safety feeling. Um, now it's very important that, that this that this legislation pass. It was rolled into the America Competes Act, but you know I'm hoping that the Senate will make sure that it stays in there in the final version of this legislation. So Chairman Merkley, um, I'm I'm asking you please to make it a priority of yours to make sure that this that this legislation ends up in the final version of whatever bill comes out through the conference process, and that we have those those P2 uh, refugee status for for our Uyghur for Uyghur uh, folks who have, who have fled China. And that's all, I, that I will yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, th thank you, and uh, I certainly uh, support that effort completely. And thank you for being such an advocate for it uh, in, the, in the House. I did want to pause and see if uh, Congresswoman Steele was still with us and wanted to ask her second question. <laughs> And if we determine that she is with us, uh, I will turn to her. Uh, otherwise, we have no other members of Congress who are waiting, but I'm going to ask a couple of uh, final questions. Um, and uh, I wanted to um, address specifically uh, Mr. Halegwa. Uh, 
you described the law on the protection of women's rights and interests and then noted that very few people, very few women actually uh, file cases involving harassment or abuse. And I think you cited six out of 83 cases, or if I got the number right. And that if they do file, they are subject to retaliation uh, and uh, countersuits regarding defamation. Uh, and so the system is completely uh, rigged and against them. And um, certainly the message that has been sent by the treatment of Peng Shui uh, seems to reinforce that, that the Chinese government is saying, uh, you will be silent when you are abused, and if you speak out, uh, you, will, you will suffer for doing so. Is that the message the Chinese government is sending? Thank you for the question, Senator. Uh, yes, I believe that there certainly, in, at least in these high-profile cases, um, certainly a mixed message at best. You know, on the one hand, the Chinese government is uh, passing laws and encouraging women you know, to come forward and complain about sexual harassment, but then we see these other acts. Uh, there was one case involving a intern from CCTV that received a lot of attention. She goes by the name Shenza. Um, and, you know, years after she had completed her internship, she posted something online about a TV news anchor who had sexually harassed her during the time. And, you know, one of the interesting parts of her account was, uh, you know, after she did so, uh, eventually she was, uh, her parents, you know, were contacted. Um, and according to her, the police or the other authorities had sort of intimidated her and tried to suggest that if she went forward and continued with her complaint or went forward with her court case, that uh, you know, there would be some repercussions uh, for her parents. You know, so this type of behavior, obviously, you know, is, is just one more reason that makes it quite the uphill battle for uh, women who have been victims of sexual harassment, uh, making that decision of whether to complain or whether to come forward. And I think that is the problem, right, the calculus uh, you know, a system that largely relies upon victims being willing to come forward, uh, being willing to talk about what happened uh, and talk about who the, you know, who, who they've been harassed by. Uh, there's already a lot of reasons to uh, not take those steps. And if we keep piling on the reasons and making it less attractive, uh, it's hard to see a path towards really getting at, um, you know, improving the situation around sexual harassment. Uh, thank you. And now I want to turn to the question that has been uh, uh, mentioned a few times, which is the potential role of U.S. companies operating in China. One can imagine uh, that these companies, uh, these U.S. companies, would say, hey, there's very capable and talented uh, women who can strengthen our operations uh, here, and perhaps they're being uh, ignored by Chinese companies. We will want to... Uh, certainly give them an opportunity to come and strengthen our efforts. But do we see U.S. businesses really, uh, that are operating in China really reaching out uh, to promote the hiring of uh, Chinese women and giving them opportunities, uh, opportunities of, of leadership and management that they might be denied in, in many Chinese companies? And I don't know, uh, Ms. Fong, is, if you want to start with that conversation, or Dr. Hong Fitcher. Thank you for the question. Um, I believe U.S. companies want to hire the best people, but they also want to be, um, they also want to work with their Chinese companies and they want to have an easy time and they also want to work with their Chinese authorities. So it's a question of which one is balanced out and which one is it. So I think the U.S. government has a role in incentivizing U.S. companies to do the right thing with regards to their workforce and gender equality for women. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator. I would just echo, you know, Chinese, sorry, American companies, uh, you know, really are in China in two roles, right? Many of them are employers, right, have their own operations there. And so I think to the extent that they can be, um, you know, 
sort of ahead of the curve in complying not only with Chinese law, but implementing practices, for instance, around sexual harassment, uh, even though the Chinese law is quite weak in terms of any consequences if you don't live up to what the regulations demand, there's no reason that American companies can't be instituting the same types of anti-sexual harassment programs in terms of policies, trainings, uh, complaint mechanisms, investigations that we would expect them to implement here in the United States. The other role that they play is as you know, purchasers, purchasers of goods and services. And we've already seen in a lot of instances where, at least through codes of conduct and auditing, uh, I'm not suggesting that those have always been particularly effective, but the mechanisms are there for U.S. companies doing business to uh, place requirements on their Chinese suppliers or in a more positive light, work with their Chinese suppliers to make sure that they are doing the types of trainings and have the right types of policies and mechanisms, uh, even to live up to the Chinese law. Right? So even if the Chinese government won't be active in enforcing its own regulations, there's no reasons that U.S. companies can't insist that the people that they buy goods and services from are living up to the letter of the Chinese law. Well, Mr. Halegua, you so there's no reason not to expect U.S. companies to abide by the same kind of same standards they might operate in the U.S. But the question is, are they? Are there examples of U.S. companies that have uh, instituted very strong programs uh, that fire uh, individuals who harass others within their, their companies that uh, uh, really make a, a point about uh, putting talented women into positions of responsibility? Or are we finding that the U.S. companies feel that this is disruptive to the um, uh, cultural dominance of, of men or disturbing to their Chinese partners? Are they, in other words, uh, what, where are they coming out in this balance? Are U.S. companies leading the way or, or are they uh, holding back? Uh, I think my knowledge of it is somewhat anecdotal um, and mostly from you know, we've definitely seen cases of, you know, I know McDonald's had a pretty well-publicized case of taking action against uh, someone who engaged in sexual harassment. Um, you know, lawyers who I talk to that work with U.S. companies operating in China uh, seem to say that they are at the, I would say, doing better than most of their Chinese counterparts uh, because of the experience that they have in the United States. I think that they actually find it difficult, you know, if you are going to have global policies for a company, it would be hard to sort of carve out China and make a different set of rules. And so I think that uh, while it's hard to generalize, you do see a lot of companies that are performing better in these areas. And Dr. Hong Fincher? This isn't really something that I pay close attention to, but uh, just based on my um, experience in China, um, I would say that a, a lot of American companies just want to play by uh, Chinese rules. And so you have the uh, for a, uh, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, um, even that may not be followed in many cases, but this is a real problem because there is, um, for example, this uh, widespread culture of uh, business drinking where um, it is quite routine to bring young women and to ply them with alcohol. And there have been many cases where these young women are then raped and uh, the people just, the rapists just get away with it. Um, and I I believe that the cases that we know about um, are Chinese companies or maybe um, lower level Chinese government officials, or in the case of Peng Shui, that it, she actually accused one of the most powerful men in China of sexually assaulting her. Um, but I would believe, based on all of the other research that I've done, that this kind of thing happens a lot more than we hear about. and. Um, and I know that there are some American companies um, that do not do as much as they should to protect the rights of women, even within their own companies, because they're protecting their own reputation as uh, their own brand at their company. Uh, th uh, thank you. I, I think it's just an important for us to keep raising this issue of what US companies uh, can do in a proactive uh, uh, way. 
And uh, finally, I want to turn, to Dr. Hong Fincher, uh, to your, your testimony uh, and just put a spotlight on it, that the Chinese government is encouraging births among the Han Chinese. At the same time, it is um, engaging in policies that uh, are seeking to stop uh, our Uyghur and other minorities from having children through sterilization, through re-education camps, uh, through forced labor camps, uh, and um, so forth. And it, it, so this, um, is there any other way to describe this than as uh, racist eugenics? Well, thank you for your question, Chairman Mark Lee. Um, this is certainly a practice of eugenics and genocide. Um, if you define genocide in, in part by uh, a deliberate attempt to reduce births of a certain uh, ethnic minority and to separate the children of uh, that ethnic minority, because that is also happening. The children of uh, Uyghur and other Turkic Muslims are being separated from their parents. Um, something that hasn't come up in this hearing is also this strong coercive element of inter-ethnic marriages where Uyghur women are pushed to marry Han Chinese men. Um, there are a lot of benefits to inter-ethnic couples and that in my view is also a deliberate attempt to kind of uh, also dilute the Uyghur population. Um, and on the flip side, uh, it, it's all part of the Chinese government's attempt to engineer a particular, quote unquote, high quality population. So it's not just about falling birth rates overall, because the Chinese government wants birth rates to fall, and it is making them fall among the Uyghur, Kazakh, and other Turkic Muslim populations. Um, there's so much evidence uh, proving that the mass campaigns of forced sterilizations among these populations. Um, and it is just a stark turnaround in population planning policy that, it, that the Chinese government went from this draconian one-child policy to now a three-child policy. So far, we don't see um, extremely coercive elements of this three-child policy, but I am concerned, as Ms. Fong uh, mentioned, there it is much more difficult for men to obtain vasectomies. I am concerned about um, perhaps a nationwide effort to uh, restrict abortion access for women, uh, Han Chinese women, to try to force them or coerce them into having more children when they don't want those children. Um, and, and it is all related to the government's view that women are reproductive tools of the Chinese state. To, they are agents of, uh, of, of the Chinese, de Chinese government's development goals. And so in the past, the goal was to limit births. And so there were forced sterilizations, forced abortions among uh, millions and millions of Han Chinese women. And now um, those very coercive practices are limited primarily to Uyghur and Turkic populations. Um, and, and it's the opposite, very pronatalist for the Han Chinese population. And by the way, the Chinese feminist activists uh, are almost all from this cohort of Han Chinese, very educated women. And if I may add, this is another reason that the Chinese government perceives the feminist movement to be such a threat is because how do they get rid of this movement? They, it, it would be very difficult for them to just jail all of the feminist activists because at the same time, the government is trying to cajole Han Chinese college educated women into having more children, into getting married and having more children. And so this is one of the key reasons that the feminist movement is so very complicated for the Chinese government to deal with.
Uh, thank you. And you did raise a point that I had not heard before about incentives for Uyghur women to mar marry Han men. What kind of incentives are you talking about? Well, there are, um, there are bonuses, for example, housing benefits um, or even cash bonuses offered to uh, couples that are marrying where it's been one of the uh, one member uh, of the marriage is Han Chinese and the other is ethnic Uyghur. Um, and that is, uh, it's a long-standing effort. It's been going on for several years. And, and then the children in that marriage are, are, would be raised according to Han Chinese customs. Uh, thank you very much. And um, thank you to each and every one of you for your testimony today to shine a light on these incredibly important uh, issues regarding the treatment of, of women in China and more broadly uh, practices uh, that uh, need to be illuminated and understood uh, by the by the world. Hopefully, in drawing attention to them, we create a process where more is done to counter these policies, uh, to end uh, these these practices. Uh, so your voices uh, are very important in moving the members of Congress and, uh, uh, and, and the world to address these issues. We will keep the, the record open until the close of business on Friday, March 4th for any items that members would like to submit for the record or if they have additional questions that they would like to ask for our witnesses. Uh, and with that, our hearing is adjourned.